Justin here at the Canadian Camp, the Western Canadian Camp 1983, and this is 4 o'clock on Sabbath afternoon. I want now to continue the same thought we were developing in our last study period and um, to, to really clarify the, the point being made, and that is this, that our only responsibility is to concern ourselves with God's orders, not to save our lives. Now I must mention the fact that every time we have received a direct command from God, we very, very carefully and thoroughly tested that command, we know it is the will of God, and that we then proceed to do it. And in the course of our doing it, our lives become threatened with immediate or very, very, very imminent death, or, or great loss and whatever else, whatever else it might happen to be. Satan will always see to it that there is a very convenient and easy way for you to turn aside and save your own life. And, and, that, and he will make it appear that this, this uh, exit, this um, way out, is God-given. And that God wants you to turn aside and take advantage of this escape route that he's uh, offered to you. It reminds me, of course, of the time when David was hiding in the cave and King Saul left his army and went in that cave alone. And every one of his soldiers said to David, Now this is a God-given opportunity for you to take the kingdom. Rise up and kill King Saul. Do it. Now, it wasn't a God-given opportunity. It was a Satan-inspired inspired temptation designed to um, lead David astray from his orders. Now, David had no orders whatsoever to stand up and take the kingdom for himself. Certainly he, he had the promise of God and the promise of God was that God would give that kingdom to him. But there was no order on God's part for him to kill the king and take that kingdom for himself. God said, I will give it to you. And when our minds go back, of course, to the birthright in Jacob's day, Jacob and Rebekah's day, Isaac and Esau, of course, do we find that God had ordered Jacob to do something about getting the birthright? Not a word, no orders whatsoever. And the plan that, ja that Rebecca and Jacob uh, became confederate in was a plan of their own devising, not of God's device in any sense of the word whatsoever. So point number one is this, then be sure that when you, in the course of obeying God's orders, are brought face to face with disaster, loss or even death, expect Satan to offer you a very simple and easy out. A, a pathway whereby you can save, you can turn aside from doing God's orders and save your own life. For instance, Elijah only had to run for his life in the dark hours of the night and put many, many miles between himself and the queen and he saved his life. But what about his work? That was the end of it, wasn't it? Okay. And you'll especially find, of course, that in the course of saving your life that uh, you thereby turn aside from your important work and when there's a combination of saving your life at the cost of your carrying out God's orders, know that you must give the priority to carrying out the orders and forget all about saving your life. And you can be absolutely sure that if you maintain a living connection with God, that you have confirmed the fact that you do in fact have the order, you're not just acting on some vague impression, some emotional moment, some enthusiasm or inspiration, and that you have been faithfully carrying out the order, that if you will ignore the opportunity to save yourself and go on carrying out the order, then even though you may find yourself staring death in the face, it's not going to happen to you because God will keep you alive until the order is complete, at least, until it's complete. Because God doesn't give us orders or commands or directives to do something and then leave us and desert us halfway through the doing of those orders. Now at this point now I want to develop the thought I placed in your minds earlier, and that is that we are not in this world to manifest our righteousness even though that righteousness be given to us from God. And this is very much a part of holy living and brings in another aspect of it which uh, we have not looked at so far. All right, now in other words, um, we, we, to illustrate my point here, we'll put down what we've, what we've seen so far and then we'll, we'll compare this with the other incentive. Now Satan never rests in this in one way or the other he gets us to turn aside from God's commands to our own ideas. All right, so in this situation we have God's orders to the individual and the individual proceeds to carry out those orders and then along the way there comes the threat, the, the pressure of a threat of death or loss or whatever else it might happen to be upon us. And at the same time 
there is the opportunity, there's the way out to save ourselves. And that is a pressure to which many, many folk in the past have succumbed, but it's a pressure to which Christ never gave in, and it's a pressure which, of course, the one forty four thousand of the Philadelphian church must never, ever bow to. Never. Now that's one way in which Satan tries to get us to turn aside from carrying out God's commands. A way in which Satan tries to get us to turn aside from the pathway of holiness, which is the pathway of obedience and the pathway of faith. Now I want now to look at another way in which Satan works to divert us from the pathway of obedience and it's a very, very different way altogether. And it is the way whereby Satan tries to have us actually live out our own divine impulses and by so doing act without the orders of God. Now this point was brought home to my mind very forcibly in Europe where one brother in particular argued strongly that uh, there wasn't enough manifestation of compassion for the poor in the, amongst the European believers. And this man and his wife were making quite a big deal out of uh, doing all kinds of good works and helping the poor, the sick, and so forth and so on, which is a good work, no, no question about that. And such a work must be manifest amongst Christians, but only under God's orders. Now let me illustrate this from the life of Jesus Christ. I'll give an illustration now where Jesus Christ, or two, two illustrations, where Jesus Christ actually turned his back upon the desperately needy in order to carry out the commands of God. I turn to page 400 and somewhere about 90, roughly. And this, uh, this statement comes to us from the chapter entitled The Last Journey from Galilee. It's page 486 is the reference I'm looking for. Page 486, Desire of Ages. 4.8.6 To the heart of Christ it was a bitter task to press his way against the fears, disappointment and unbelief of his beloved disciples. It was hard to lead them forward to the anguish and despair that awaited them at Jerusalem. And Satan was at hand to press his temptations upon the Son of Man. Why should he now go to Jerusalem to certain death? All around him were souls hungering for the bread of life on every hand were suffering ones waiting for his word of healing. The work to be wrought by the gospel of his grace was but just begun and he was full of the vigor of manhood's prime. Why not go forward to the vast fields of the world with the words of his grace, the touch of his healing power? Why not take to himself the joy of giving light and gladness to those darkened and sorrowing millions? Why leave the harvest gathering to his disciples so weak in faith, so dull of understanding, so slow to act. Why face death now and leave the work in its infancy? The foe who in the wilderness had confronted Christ assailed him now with fierce and subtle temptations. Had Jesus yielded for a moment, had he changed his course in the least particular to save himself, Satan's agency would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. Now let's look at this particular story now. And, uh, and see what the temptation or pressure was this time to draw Jesus Christ from his divine orders. So we'll start off here at the beginning now with the statement once again, God's orders. Now what were God's orders at this time? They were to go down to Jerusalem at once, no delay, and there be crucified to pay the penalty for perishing humanity. Those were God's orders. Now what does Satan use, and they were Satan's temptations because it says here, the foe or first of all, and Satan was at hand to press his temptations upon the Son of Man. Now, did Satan at this point of time threaten Jesus with death, or did he offer to save him from the cross? Right. But more importantly, Satan pointed to something, namely the thousands upon thousands of perishing souls around about him and as Christ viewed these perishing souls that view or that vision of realization would draw from him a tremendous desire to act in a way contrary to God's commandments so let's, let's put down here then the, the multitudes or I'll just put the word sick and the needy and in Jesus Christ in him there, were, there was sympathy there was love and there was compassion. 
All right? So sympathy, love, and compassion were mighty forces within Jesus Christ, and are they to be likewise mighty forces within the experience of the Christian? Absolutely. Sympathy for the perishing, love for the dying, and compassion for the, for the, sin, the, sin, the sin-cursed and needy and so forth is to be a very powerful mo- uh, emotions or principles in the life of the Christian. Now then, think about it carefully. If the only factor, the only factor governing Christ's behaviour was the expression of his sympathy, his love and compassion, what would he have done as, when he saw those thousands upon thousands of sick people? Never well, I'm saying that was the only, without this, without that. If that was the only factor in his behaviour, what would he have done? He'd have gone and ministered to those perishing thousands, right? He would have done that. But there was another factor. What was the other factor? God's orders, right? So instead of, instead of manifesting his sympathy, love and compassion, he obeyed God's orders and by obeying those orders, orders he was manifesting God's character and what greater manifestation of sympathy, love and compassion is found on the cross of Calvary, right? What greater manifestation can there be? <clears throat> Let's turn now to another story and this time the resurrection of Lazarus an experience that um, Christ had after he went down to Jerusalem and of course the word of God says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and we know the story of Lazarus fairly well I think it can be a couple of years ago I took up the story quite in detail but just now I want to draw some major points from it in respect to the same matter of um, exercising wisdom and remembering that we're here not to manifest our compassion but to manifest his compassion under his direction or will be instruments for the manifestation of God's compassion now bear in mind that you're going to be very very seriously misunderstood if you live by these principles there is nothing and I say again there is nothing that Satan fears and hates so much as the person who lives by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God isn't that right? that no one, he, no one he hates and fears so much and there is no one who will work so hard to break down and to, to pressurise into leaving God's commands and doing his own and in fact the battle of Armageddon is going to be Satan's attempt to bring such pressure upon the people of God they will turn from their allegiance Sister White says and allegiance means loyalty and loyalty means obedience doesn't it? to turn from their obedience to follow Satan's suggestions now the battle of Armageddon is going to be won not by God's folk doing very much but mainly by their doing nothing right mainly, mainly by their doing nothing for instance during the 40 days in the desert how did Christ gain the victory over Satan by doing something or doing nothing by doing nothing when Satan said do something Christ would not do it he refrained from doing it and so likewise the the saints of God during Jacob's trouble will likewise gain the victory not by running around doing things but by not doing them it'll be the most interesting victory ever gained because usually victories are gained by very active soldiers who do a lot of hard fighting to get the victory won now I want now to examine from the story of Lazarus how Jesus Christ put God's commands ahead of all other considerations and um, apparently manifested a coldness toward Lazarus when the apostles thought he ought to, ought to have manifested uh, warmth and sympathy and love toward them. I turn now to page 5 to 6 in the book Desire of Ages and uh, on, these, on this page we're told how that Lazarus became sick and the two sisters sent their message to Christ saying to him, He whom thou lovest is sick. And... Um, we read now on, on, on the same page when Christ heard the message the disciples thought he received it coldly he did not manifest the sorrow they expected him to show looking up to them he said that the sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of Man might be glorified thereby for two days he remained in the place where he was this delay was a mystery to the, to the disciples what a comfort his presence would be to the afflicted household they thought his strong affection for the family at Bethany was well known to the disciples 
And they were surprised that he did not respond to the sad message, He whom thou lovest is sick. Now, note those words, Christ's strong affection for the family at Bethany was well known to the disciples. In other words, they knew that in Jesus Christ there was a great depth of sympathy, love and compassion for that family. And knowing what was in Jesus Christ, as well as in themselves for that matter, not to the same extent by any means, but it was there just the same, what did they expect him to do? They thought he would respond to his own righteousness and motivated by what was in himself, he would then go and heal this sick man in Bethany. That's what they thought that Christ would do. And when he did not do it, then they criticized him very severely, very severely. In fact, they came to doubt whether after all he was, in fact, the Messiah. Let's now read the paragraph which describes their doubts and their criticisms of Christ. During the two days, Christ seemed to have dismissed the message from his mind, but, but he, for he did not speak of Lazarus. The disciples thought of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. They had wondered why Jesus, with the power to perform wonderful miracles, had permitted John to languish in prison and to die a violent death. Possessing such power, why did not Christ save John's life? This question had often been asked by the Pharisees who presented it as an unanswerable argument against Christ's claim to be the Son of God. The Saviour had warned his disciples of trials, losses and persecution. Would he forsake them in trial? Some questioned if they had mistaken his mission. All were deeply troubled. And so those disciples criticised Christ severely and doubted him very, very extensively because he did not live out his own heart of sympathy but obeyed God's orders, right? Now, don't be surprised then. In fact, be surprised otherwise. But you must not be surprised but rather expect that when you, in like manner, put God's orders first and because of that, there may come an occasion when you, you turn your back upon a person that seems to need your help, don't be surprised if you're criticised and maligned and even persecuted for taking such a stand. It happened to Christ, it'll happen to you too. Now the facts are, of course, there's been many, many occasions when God's orders, uh, when God will present the sick and the needy to you and his orders will be to help and bless those sick people. But in order, in order for us to learn this vital lesson, the lesson that to obey is better than to serve, in, in a capacity otherwise than we and God has ordered to us that obey is the first and most important thing that is the lesson God designed us to learn obedience and faith those are the two most important lessons we learn those lessons then of course we really learn what holy living is and we should be holy people and that's why of course Samuel said to King Saul what did he say to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams Obedience is the all-important lesson to be learned in this respect. Now, <clears throat> let's turn to Desire pages 668 for a moment before we come back to um, this page on page 526. Page 668, we have a very, very fine statement which reads as follows. We read it before we read this camp meeting. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Now that's the truth. But here is something which is not the truth. Let's turn the statement around. First of all, again, what does it say? That when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. That's what the statement says. It does not say that when carrying out our own impulses, we shall be obeying him. Now, does it? That's the other side of the story altogether, isn't it? Did, did you get the difference? Let me say it again. It says, when obeying him, we shall be by carrying out our own impulses. It does not say, when carrying out our own impulses, we're necessarily obeying him. Sometimes it may be so, we are, yes. Now, let's take it as it reads, first of all, when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. It's impossible to truly obey God unless the spirit of obedience is first of all within us. That, that is essential. Unless that spirit is there, 
So our very impulse is to obey the word of God. We can't truly obey him, right? But if we merely act from our own impulses, even though those impulses were given to us from God, as Christ might have done back there, then we can obey those impulses without obeying God in any sense of the word whatsoever. I came back to the story of Lazarus, of course. We know perfectly well that if Jesus Christ had ignored God's plan and God's orders in respect to Lazarus and had gone down to Bethany and healed that man of his sickness, the disciples, the, the disciples would have been very pleased. They would not have criticized him. They would not have doubted his mission. And they would have quoted the result as certain vindication that the end justified the means. Now I've been impressed of late, especially in Germany, that uh, we must never ever try and prove a point merely by the use of an illustration. Illustrations or an experience, I should better say. Because if we do that, an experience can be used to prove almost anything. Now, for instance, was it necessary in God's great plan for Lazarus to die? Was that necessary? It was. It was very necessary. Because without that death and resurrection, Christ could not have given the crowning miracle which, which fully revealed and confirmed the fact that God was the life giver. It would have been impossible. Now, not for one moment are we saying that God planned the death of Lazarus. Not for a moment are we saying that. Because God didn't plan it. Satan planned it. And Satan planned the death of Lazarus for very, very good reasons. The only two people that I read about... Um, in all of, the, all of the lifetime of Jesus Christ that came near to understanding his mission was John the Baptist and Lazarus. And I, I, we say, of course, Mary and Martha. But let's just confine ourselves to these two men, or these, these to John and the household of Lazarus. They're just these two, two instances or two situations. Now, John the Baptist, down toward the end of his, of his uh, life, before he was beheaded, did come to understand the nature of Christ's mission and to recognize that the spirit of self-abnegation, which was his spirit, was the spirit by which the kingdom was being built. And self-abnegation, of course, is putting God first and ourselves out of the picture altogether. Now, John the Baptist had therefore been a great strength to Jesus Christ, even though they had not worked together as uh, personal co-workers. Now, Mary and Martha and Lazarus understood the mission of Jesus Christ as not even his own disciples did. Now I know this because when Lazarus became sick, they did not, the sisters did not send to Jesus Christ a solution. They didn't say come and heal him. All they said was what? He whom thou lovest is sick. In other words, we've got a problem. You're the problem solver and we leave you to solve this problem in whatever way you see best. Remember, of course, the distinction between Christian and Babylonian prayers what do Babylonians present to God? Solutions. What do Christians present? Problems. And uh, when Lazarus died, I now read from page 5 to 6, when Lazarus died, they were bitterly disappointed. But they felt the sustaining grace of Christ and this kept them from inflicting any blame on the Saviour. In other words, they, um, they did not cast any blame upon Jesus Christ whatsoever. And that indicated they rest in them in the will of God and the purpose of God. Now when, when Satan saw Christ withdrawing from time to time to the home of Lazarus and Christ gaining from the sweet fellowship he had there a strength and, and a courage that uh, he needed, although Christ of course could live without that, at the same time he was very glad to get that and helped him enormously in his... Um, in his struggles against the powers of darkness, <clears throat> then Satan determined to cut off the source of strength that uh, Christ was, was enjoying and experiencing. And this is what made Lazarus the special target of Satan and, and, Satan, and, and caused Satan to determine to destroy him, which he did. Now God let him, because God saw in this the, opportun the opportunity to achieve two things. Number one, Satan would thereby reveal before the onlooking universe his real character of malignity and uh, meanness and hate and pride and so forth and that was one side of the question and the other side of course um, the death of Lazarus would, would provide God with an opportunity of, uh, uh, to um, manifest or reveal 
a very, very essential part of Christ's mission which otherwise he could not have revealed. And that's made very apparent on page 5 to 8 in the book Desire of Ages where I read these words. Had Christ been in the sick rooms, Lazarus would not have died for Satan would have, no, would have had no power over him. Death could not have aimed his dart at Lazarus in the presence of the life giver. Therefore Christ remained away. He suffered the enemy to exercise his power that he might drive him back a conquered foe. He permitted, he permitted Lazarus to pass under the dominion of death and the suffering sister saw their brother laid in the grave. So there was a very, very definite purpose involved in this whole drama. Now, if, for instance, Christ had gone down to Bethany under God's command and raised Lazarus up, a great victory would have been gained. But by letting Satan go a little further and to take the life of Lazarus, a greater, a much greater victory was gained and there was a far greater manifestation of God's sympathy love and compassion and there would have been if Lazarus hadn't died isn't that right? okay now could the apostles understand that difference? could they? they couldn't now we human beings have a problem and our problem is that we cannot understand God's ways or God's workings I'd like to read now from Patriarchs and Prophets in regard to this and this deals with the experience of David when he um, left uh, the land of Israel and went across to live with the Philistines the reference is page 672 in the book Patriarchs and Prophets 672 Patriarchs and Prophets 672 the statement says David's conclusion that Saul would certainly accomplish his murderous purpose was formed without the counsel of God even while Saul was plotting and seeking to accomplish his destruction the Lord was working to secure David the kingdom. God works out his plans that the human eyes they are veiled in mystery. Men cannot understand the ways of God. Did you hear that? Men cannot understand the ways of God. Uh, and looking at appearances, they interpret the trials and tests and provings that God permits to come upon them as things which are against them and that will only work their ruin. Thus David looked on appearances and not at the promises of God. He doubted that he would ever come to the throne. Long trials had wearied his faith and exhausted his patience. Now if we can't understand the workings of God, then what are we left to do? Trust God. Isn't that right? One thing we do know or we should know is that God loves us. He will do nothing which is against us. That anything he does is for us. And even though trials and tests and provings are permitted to come upon us, they are for our best good because they are working in us an educational process by which alone we can achieve the status of true Philadelphians. And therefore we have to glory, glory in these trials and tribulations, trusting that God knows what he's doing as he permits those things to come upon us. So when Christ did not go down to the sick room in the days of um, the sickness of uh, Lazarus, what should the apostles have said? They should have said, well, we don't understand the ways of God. That's for sure. The word of God tells us that. But one thing we do know, God knows what he's doing. Christ is obeying his orders and all we have to do is to patiently wait until we see the outworking of this divine plan. Now if they said that, would they have had rest? They would have, wouldn't they? Would they have been obedient and trusting and therefore, what? Holy. Right, they would have been holy but they manifested of course a disposition toward unholiness when they took the stand which they did on that particular occasion <clears throat> now while we're about it we'll take a look at the arguments the Pharisees have put to um, them over and over again um, let's back here in the Zyvaz of Patriarchs and Prophets so I turn now to um, back to page 526 again and um, when these disciples were troubled in regard to Christ not manifesting his own compassion, love and sympathy but rather obeying God's commands then they thought about the death of John the Baptist and before I get to the death of John the Baptist I'd like to make a very strong point here I think it's a strong point and that is this who has the greater heart of love, 
sympathy and compassion you or God God has right now then when God's orders direct you to leave a suffering person for the time being which of course seems very illogical to the human mind and our heart of love and sympathy says let's do something for this, for this perishing soul but God's orders say leave him for the time being then don't we start to feel that we have more compassion than God is, is that the temptation is that but who has the greater compassion God does and he's also the greater wisdom so, so the combination of greater wisdom and greater compassion and God's determination to manifest the, his compassion at all times should persuade us to trust him to know how his compassion can best be manifested now this is not a question for one moment of whether we manifest sympathy or don't manifest sympathy it's a matter of how our sympathy is to be manifested that is the issue <clears throat> For instance, when God's order said that Jesus Christ go to the cross and Satan presented before Jesus Christ the perishing thousands and hundreds of thousands around about him, then it was a question as to whether he would manifest sympathy, love and compassion by healing those sick people now or by going to the cross. It was an issue. The issue was how would he manifest that love and sympathy? He couldn't do it both ways. He couldn't go to the cross now and at the same time spend years working for these sick and needy people, could he? Could he do both? It was impossible. It was one or the other. And who was left to make the decision as to which it would be? Christ or his father? Right, his father was. Christ went to the cross. And remember on page 480... What was the game? Just 86 is right, right. Uh, that's correct, right. Now, it says on this page, the foe who in the wilderness had confronted Christ to sell him now with fierce and subtle temptations. And the temptation was to turn aside to heal the sick instead of going to the cross. Had Jesus yielded for a moment, just for one moment of time, had he changed his course in the least particular to save himself, Satan's agency would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. So how critically important it was that Christ subdue even his own divine sympathy and love in order to obey the commands of God and um, in a situation like that we felt two pulls one to save the sect and one to go to the cross what was the, what was the question which saved him in that situation? What are my orders? That question will always save you from trouble provided of course you live where you know what God's orders for you are that's the important critical problem which we'll discuss a little later people always ask me the question well how do I know what God wants me to do the answer is quite simple really and we have the promise the promises where the Lord says that each of us will know just what course to pursue and if God says we will know it then we can know it and there's no excuse for not knowing it now I must um, emphasize here of course the point that um, there is a counterfeit Sabbath rest message in circulation and uh, just the other day I sat in the room with a person who said well the Lord uh, gave this to me and the Lord led me here and the Lord did this and the Lord did that and yet that person um, doesn't know I think it doesn't has, ne has heard this message again and again but never accepted it and, um, and I can't believe that the Lord is speaking to a person who doesn't accept this message and um, but, but only, only goes their own way really now I learnt in that interview with this person that there is a critical, critical combination and number one is that there must be a living connection established between the individual and the Lord a living connection now for instance you're, each of you is a member of the body of Christ if you're a born again Christian which I trust you all are and I too am a member of the body of Christ Christ is the head and we're all members together some of course have large responsibilities some of us are instruments for the communication of God's light to the rest of us for the time being but the day is coming when you will all be prophets and prophetesses when the loud cry begins now this thing as a member my mind says it wiggles so what does it do? it wiggles very interesting activity uh, it, it obeys my mind or my head because there is a, a, an unbroken living connection between that finger and the head isn't that right? but if I cut the finger off which I don't plan to do and place it over here in the desk separated from my body the living connection is now broken 
Then my mind says, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And what's it do? <laughs> Pardon? Nothing is right because there's no living connection, is there? All right? There's no living connection. Now, out there in the Adventist world or the Protestant world, for instance, you'll find that there's some people who do a lot of praying and a lot of studying. They'll spend hours now studying God's Word and praying. They will claim the promises, promises of God's guidance and so forth, but they have never been born again. They reject the message of bondage to freedom. Now, do you get a living connection by studying the Bible and praying all along without being born again, or must you first of all be born again? You must be born again, right? You must be born again. Because unless Jesus Christ is in you the hope of glory, there is no living connection. Now then, once the living connection has been established, then, then the practical procedures laid out in our message on God's Sabbath rest, for instance, in this book, God's Sabbath rest, and the studies you've heard that before, can now be applied. But, but without those two things, a living connection and correct procedures and the spirit of obedience in the mind and in the heart, then of course these principles don't work. They can't work. You'll find out there, of course, there's some folk who emphasise the procedures, some folk who emphasise the living connection without, without becoming born again, and uh, those are counterfeits of the real Sabbath rest message. And furthermore, you also find folk who live by impressions. They get this impression, and that impression, and the other impression. They act, they act very spontaneously upon these impressions, and then they wonder why they end up in very serious disaster because they've simply obeyed on an impression. We must learn, as Sister White says, page 363, we must learn to... Uh, how's it go again? I'll just find the reference and read it. All need an individual experience in learning the will of God. Right, and everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speak into the heart. So each one of us has to develop a personal experience in learning how to hear the voice of God and to learn the will of God. Three six three desire of ages. It's right in the middle of the last paragraph on the page. Three sixty three. We must we must uh, we each need, need to obtain individual experience in knowing the will of God. Or where's that effect? Now the Pharisees, of course, who had no idea of the divine principles, kept throwing the question up to Christ's disciples. Now look, if your master has such tremendous power, then why did he permit John to languish in prison and to die a violent death? Now were a loving, compassionate, sympathetic person do that uh, to one who had rendered him great service. And the, and the Pharisees criticised Christ very, very severely for allowing John to die and claim that Christ's attitude toward John was proof that Christ did not have a heart of love, sympathy and compassion and therefore Christ could not be God nor the child of God. Now, does that, to the ordinary human mind, does that sound like a very convincing argument? It certainly does. A very convincing argument. And it takes a very, very close walk with God and a clear grasp of the divine principles to rise above that kind of argument. Now, the facts are, of course, that Christ gave to John a far greater gift as an expression of his love by allowing him to die and to be raised again as he was at the, at the resurrection of Jesus and to now be in heaven where he is. We know he's in heaven because we're told here in the Zion of Ages that, that those who were raised up in Christ was were those who had been co-workers with God and who at the cost of their lives had borne witness to the truth. Now had John been a co-worker with God? Absolutely. Had, had, he, had he at the cost of his life borne witness to the truth? Absolutely. So he was in that special resurrection. Anyone who doesn't have the reference we'll find for you in just a moment. The reference is found in the chapter The Lord is Risen, again in the book Desire of Ages, and the page should be page 786. 786 is right. I'll read the statement. As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. The earthquake of his death had rent open their graves, and when he arose, they came forth with him. They were those who had been co laborers with God and who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead. Now put yourself in John the Baptist's position and, and um, supposing that um, God had come there and said, now, okay, John, I'm going to offer you two gifts as an expression of my love and you can take your choice as to which gift you're going to have. 
Gift number one is to be delivered from prison. That'll be a gift of love. I'll take you out of prison and you can live a long, quiet life for the rest of your days. Gift number two is to experience being beheaded. I should go back to gift number one. Gift number one, to be taken from prison, to lead a life upon this earth and probably outlive Christ upon the cross, almost certainly. Eventually die and then lay in your grave for the next couple of thousand years until the second coming. That's one gift. The other gift is to stay in prison and be beheaded, lay in the grave for about maybe two, two and a half years, something like that, then be raised up and go to heaven. Which would you, which would you pick? Which is the greater gift of love? The answer is obvious, isn't it? Pardon? What are you saying? Die quick. Die quick, yes. <laughs> Die quick and be raised up quickly. Because if John had lived upon this earth beyond the lifespan of Christ, he could not have participated in that resurrection which, which took care only of those who prior to Christ's death had died for the sake of the truth. So then, the manifestation of love, sympathy and compassion to John the Baptist was far better expressed in a way which the disciples could not understand nor accept and which the Pharisees used to continually criticise and persecute Jesus Christ but... Um, by Christ obeying his father's orders and not going down to the miserable dungeon where, where John the Baptist was by not delivering him from prison but by leaving him to die John was given a far greater gift of love than if he had been allowed to live and survive Christ's death upon Calvary's cross and of course the apostles couldn't understand that they couldn't and, and, and it was a continuous source of embarrassment to them when the Pharisees kept uh, uh, criticising Christ in their presence and casting doubts in their minds obviously of course the Pharisees they had no spirit of love no, no spirit of obedience no spirit of compassion or, or truth in them and therefore their arguments of course could never be regarded as being truly valid arguments in a situation of this nature now this lesson then today demonstrates I think with great clarity that there are at least two ways in which Satan tries to lead you away from the pathway of obedience and one is to put tremendous, a tremendous threat of death against you and at the same time offer you a way out to save yourself that's one way he does it the other way is to uphold before you the, the work of, of saving the sick and the needy which um, very often as I said God is going to put the sick and the needy before you to, to test your compassion and uh, when we seek orders from here say bless those sick people help them and so forth go ahead and do it by all means but there also come situations where God will say now your duty lies in this direction go and do that work and lead that sick person to perish if need be I'll take care of them and the facts are of course that um, God may have two plans for that sick person that you are called upon to leave alone one plan is that God has somebody else to minister to that sick person who can do a better job than you can or I can and the other, the other point is that God may be seeking to give that sick person a lesson of trust in him or teach that, that person some, some, um, some lessons that uh, he otherwise could not learn through suffering for at least a time being. And if you rush in, of course, and uh, take over the work of taking care of that sick person, you'll prevent God from teaching that person the lesson he needs to learn. And at the same time, of course, you're being ta taught the lessons of obedience. So then, in short, the point comes up very clearly and plainly that the Philadelphians are a people who will be a holy people and therefore an obedient, believing people. They will obey regardless of the consequences and they'll ask only two, two questions, what are my orders and what are the promises? Knowing they shall, they shall obey the one and trust the other. I do trust you all grow to be very good Philadelphians. That's time to quit again, I'm sorry. But 45 minutes is gone. Now then, uh, once again, I'll let you folk choose the hymn. I had a whole list chosen, but every, every hymn I choose, you folk don't know, so I give up. <laughs> you haven't heard the whole list yet. Well, you're going to try 616 then. Let's see what 616 has to say. If you don't know it, then 616, 616. The home where changes never come. Oh, wait and murmur not. Do you know it? <laughs> do you think that was a part? Do you don't know it? <coughs> Don't you forget this song? <laughs> well, we're going to sing this week, I promise you. Pick something else. I've got 617. Is my name written there? 